Uh, today I'm talking to Judith Hanks, who joins us from the University of Leeds. Um, we're at Nanzan University in Nagoya, and she's uh, given a, a plenary speech for us yesterday. Um, thank you for coming, Judith. You're welcome. Um, and yesterday you talked about exploratory practice, um, which is a kind of research uh, method, process. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain a little bit about what that is? Yeah, so exploratory practice is a form of practitioner research um, which aims to involve learners and teachers who explore, investigate, research their own learning and teaching practices. So what's going on in the classroom. Yes. Um, so I think it's quite distinctive in that it, it, it encourages learners to join in that researching process as well as teachers. And it's also distinctive, I think, in that it starts with why questions. So these puzzles or puzzlement, really, I think is a, a better way of putting it to say, you know, being puzzled, hmm, I wonder why... What, 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 so, yeah. Okay, and you shared with us some uh, interesting examples from some of the exploratory practice that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a couple of examples of the kind of puzzles that your students had? Um, yes, um, one of them, uh, not one that I talked about yesterday, but from a previous case study, was why, why do I lose concentration in class? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, that's an interesting one. Um, one student followed up sort of quite extensively. Uh, another one was, why can't I speak as well as I think? Mm. Um, which again, you know, on the surface looks like a fairly simple question, but mm. actually when you dig a little deeper, which is what they did, it was actually quite complex. Mm. Uh, another one would be, um, why can't I remember new vocabulary even though I know it mm -hmm. so what they what they were saying was you know I I know that word but I don't remember it and use it mm -hmm. um, so they investigated that so yeah so where would you say exploratory practice fits um, in a kind of framework of, of research mm -hmm. as a whole um, it sounds like there are some similarities perhaps with action research yeah I think action research exploratory practice I, I think is almost a reaction against action research, certainly the action research of the early 1990s, which had a very strong focus on problems and problem solving. Mm. So exploratory practice was developed to move away from that and to sort of say, well, hmm, problem solving, you, you might solve the problem of uh, why can't I remember vocabulary? Mm. by sort of giving solutions like keep a vocabulary notebook or try to force yourself to use that mm. word or whatever. Try to put yourself in situations where that word will come up. Um, but you don't really understand why the thing happened in the first place. And I think that, that's what interested me about exploratory practice is that it, uh, it tries to investigate rather than solving the problem it actually tries to say, well, why does this happen? This, this is interesting. And as a byproduct, you might solve the problem, but that's not really the aim of the exercise. One of the other differences as well, I, I, from reading uh, the book that you co-authored with Dick Allwright, um, one of the things that I, I really remembered was that uh, the beneficiaries of traditional research are often not the participants. Yes. But exploratory practice tries to um, change that. Yeah. 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 Um, so, I suppose with traditional research, we would publish, we would present, mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't necessarily inform the participants of the findings. Mm -hmm. So, can you explain how this works with exploratory practice? Well, I think, like I was saying yesterday, that, that I think the exciting thing for me about exploratory practice is that it, it tries to involve the the people who really should be the recipients of the findings of research, um, and we'll perhaps talk about that this afternoon as well in the question and answer uh, panel, I think, so the teachers and the learners are the ones who are in the classroom, and if they set the questions, they set the research agenda, um, 
the findings are what they have found out. They, they are relevant to those people in the classroom. In terms of disseminating the information, um, there's, there's a real question there, I think, about who do you disseminate that information to? Because these are people who are just starting out on their research careers. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of their findings are very preliminary, um, and so who are they going to share those findings with? Most of the time, it's other teachers and other learners, most likely locally. Um, but I don't think that, that that in any way denigrates what they found out. Um, it's still relevant. It, it certainly seemed exciting to the people that I was working with. Um, it, it seemed to motivate them, the fact that they were doing something that was relevant to them. Um, what I think would be really interesting for a kind of future step would be, and I was talking with, I think she's called Catherine Thornton, yes. uh, yesterday, about, she, she raised the possibility of students publishing. Mm. Um, and wouldn't it be great to get those students, whether they're students of language or students of applied linguistics or whatever, but to, to actually start publishing themselves and to try, I mean it's a, it's a push, but to try and get these large formal publications to, to, um, to create a space for learner learner's just, voice yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah it, and you do you do have some but it, it tends to be the minority I think. well it, it seems to me that it it could be a very effective way of improving yourself as a teacher and as a learner yeah but not perhaps as a recognized academic mm. with the current structures that we have yeah, yeah um so you still have to do traditional forms of research mm -hmm. to, to advance your career yes yeah Okay, um, so how did you come to exploratory practice? What was your journey to, to finding it? I came to exploratory practice in 1997 when I started my master's degree uh, at Lancaster University and uh, Dick Allwright was one of my tutors there. Um, <coughs> and he wasn't really in any way kind of promoting EP. Mm. It's just in, in one session in the whole year he happened to mention, oh, this is what's been happening in Rio. Uh, and I thought, well, this sounds interesting. And what particularly interested me at that time was uh, he talked about the teachers in Rio who were experiencing burnout. They were exhausted. They're often running two, three jobs in, in often deprived areas, not always, but you know, it, it's a tough life. To then, so they're, they're busy people, to then add research requirements on top of that, which is often what was happening, um, was beyond exhaustion for many of them. Um, and, and in my own career at that time, I was, I was pretty close to burnout too. I'd taken a year out to do my masters, and I thought this this says something to me. You know, something that tries to use what we already do in the classroom as a tool for uh, investigating. And so I was particularly attracted by that. Um, and my MA dissertation. It's interesting you ask about the question, uh, where does EP fit? Because my MA dissertation was essentially looking at what's the difference between a problem and a puzzle? Mm. Why, why do we have this emphasis on why questions? Mm. Why does it matter? Mm. And I, I found that actually it does matter, this, this notion that you, you are trying to broaden understandings, or, or better, to deepen understanding, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily to solve a problem. Mm. So I, I thought that was, that was where I started. Mm. Um, and then a couple of years later, I was uh, very honoured because Dick asked if I would like to write the book together. Mm. Um, and that took us a couple of years. The book came out in 2009. And really, everything's gone on since then. I'm, my, my interest in, in EP has continued um, 
so that again, you know, these, these ideas of these principles, that it, for me, it certainly it's been sustainable, and it's, it's made my life in teaching more interesting for me. Yes. You know, where I was in 1997 was perhaps a bit jaded, a bit tired, kind of seen it all, done it all. Well, that's how I felt at the mm -hmm. time. Um, <coughs> EP kind of gave me that impetus and that interest to kind of, oh, right, classrooms are interesting. Mm -hmm. People in classrooms are interesting. Uh, it was a, one of the things that you mentioned yesterday, actually, uh, some of the students and teachers' comments uh, about kind of tired or jaded topics yes. that we use. Yeah. Um, and you brought up recycling, but yeah. I'm sure that any teacher could go through a list of, mm -hmm. yes, 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 I've yeah. done this topic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what was beautiful about EP is that uh, the students find something which they actually want to talk about. Yeah. And uh, of course, that's very motivational, and it mm -hmm. also keeps the teachers fresh because they're learning something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that that really hit home with me, I think. Mm, good. Yeah. Um, I I want to go back to to the kind of technical aspects of the research a little bit more as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about publication and sharing and dissemination. What about the ethical questions? Uh, mm -hmm. We just heard in our second plenary from Robert Croker about. Um, how important ethics are. Yeah, um, yeah. We are a little bit behind in Japan and there are some places that it, it's not really an issue so mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. um, but I know in the UK it's, it's very huge. important to yeah. go through everything and, and in the US and so yeah, on. Yeah. Um, so how do you square EP and For me, EP, one, one of, the, well there's, I mean there's so many different dimensions to the ethical question but one of the things I, I briefly touched on yesterday is this question about um, anonymity mm. and empowerment. Though those two seem to me to be working against each other at the moment. Mm. So my institution has a very strong um, ethos that um, participants should be anonymised. Mm. And to me, yes, in no way would you want to put anybody in harm's way, you'd want to make sure that they are protected. However, the work that I presented yesterday, okay, it was my work in the sense that I wrote the PhD, but I couldn't have done that without their particip participation. So the teachers, at the very least, I think, have the right, deserve to be recognised um, for the work that they did. So the person I called Jenny, mm. she came up with some really interesting insights. Surely she should have her role in that mm. acknowledged and her proper name given. Mm. So I think that there are some very, very interesting questions about ethics um, involved in exploratory practice. And I could go on, do you want to? <laughs> yes, well, well, I suppose... If we use the word, in well, no, not really, but if we use the word participants, yeah. I suppose it'd be you might use different terminology. They're mm. not subjects, certainly. Absolutely. That's a very different that's issue. They're co-authors or collaborators. Yeah. It is yeah. very much a thing that you do together. Yes. In which case, the ethical questions that are usually asked perhaps mm. don't fit exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, I think there's a very interesting article, I think it's by Pring, in about 2001, which talks about... Um, the ethical researcher behaving uh, virtuously. Mm. So rather than having a sort of checklist of, you know, tick, 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 um, I, I've had a um, consent informed to a certain extent, um, although how, how informed is anyone ever? <clears throat> so that, that kind of checklist, those codes of practice, and he says, no, actually, What's more important, those codes of practice don't match reality, and what's more important is for the researcher to behave in a virtuous manner. So considering the different aspects of every part of the research, and I think that, that was what I was trying to do, um, not to just sort of follow blindly a, a checklist, but actually to sort of really think about, well, what are the ethical dimensions to this? And, um, we were at a, um, we gave a, an IATEFL workshop day, Dick and I, together with Asya, Sil Asya Slimani Rolls, mm -hmm. uh, Yasmin Dar, and uh, Anna Ina 
Salvi, which I hope will be online sooner mm -hmm. or later. Uh, it's the IATEFL Research SIG. Um, and two of Yasmin's students actually came, the two participants mm -hmm. in her mm -hmm. study, actually came to the forum mm -hmm. and talked about what they had found. Mm -hmm. And I found that uplifting. Mm -hmm. You know, here they were, properly recognised mm -hmm. as co-researchers, mm -hmm. not as subjects, not as objects, but actually as people on the same level. And I, that I found really yeah, exciting. That was, there was something that came out actually from, from something you mentioned yesterday. Uh, I think the teacher, one of your teachers said that they saw the students or the learners uh, as more adult human yeah. beings because yeah. they weren't just recycling the mm -hmm. same sort of subject matter, but they were it made them more adult and more responsive, it allowed them to, to show their yeah. kind of responsibility and, yeah. and motivation. Yeah, yeah. I think it cha EP challenges mm -hmm. roles and identities mm -hmm. and assumptions that we make, mm -hmm. both teachers and learners, because I think the learners can have as many assumptions <laughs> as, as the teachers. Um, so uh, it, it can be quite subversive, mm -hmm. and again, I, I find that quite a, quite a thrill. Would you say, um, I mean, we've talked about it as a research methodology, but mm -hmm. could you say it's as much of a teaching methodology yeah. as a research methodology? Yeah. yeah, and in fact, that's where the conclusion of my mm -hmm. thesis is heading, is that mm -hmm. um, certainly in the study that I did, the potential for pedagogy, mm -hmm. EP as a pedagogical mm -hmm. idea, is, is, is huge. Um, and, and one of the questions that I'll, I'll raise this afternoon is, thinking about EP as a form of research, I think one of the questions people often ask is what those learners did, does that really count? Does that count as research? You know, research, there's a hierarchy. Um, working in a British university, I'm very aware of that, that, um, you know, that there are people who do research and then there are people who are researched upon. Um, EP tries to bridge that gap and it is subversive but it does open the question you know that the things that the teachers and learners were doing they were small scale low level not big impact well they had impact on people themselves but not big impact on the field um, so is what they did does it count as research I would say yes it does but we need to have a broader interpretation of what research is. Not everybody would agree with that. But certainly the, the, uh, the findings from my, my PhD were that the potential for it as a pe pedagogical tool is, is very exciting, very, very big. Okay, well we look forward to seeing what happens in the future. So yeah. let's keep our eyes on EP. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much Judith.